Hello, and welcome to Middlebury Edition. I'm Middlebury Representative Robin Shai, your host for the program. Middlebury Edition was created for the purpose of educating Middlebury residents and about local services and activities, and to provide an opportunity for local nonprofit organizations to talk about their work. Today's guest is Bill Brooks, Executive Director of the Henry Sheldon Museum. Most people know that the Sheldon Museum is located right down in downtown Middlebury, but did you know that it is the oldest community-based museum in the country? The museum offers many exhibits, programs, and events, and we'll talk about some of them today on the show. They've also recently received a grant from the Vermont Arts Council, and there's a leadership change in the offing, so we have lots of ground to cover. Welcome, Bill. Well, thank you. Good yeah. morning. Good morning. It's great to have you here. Um, let's start with the man himself. Who was Henry Sheldon, and why did he end up having a museum named after him? Well, Henry Sheldon, a unique character, was born in um, Salisbury, Vermont, on August uh, 15, 1821. Wow. He was one of uh, several, had several brothers. It was a farming community, and a uh, matter of fact, you can still see the barn as you travel down uh, Route 7. Hmm. And um, he began collecting early, he had a passion for collecting, but he had several jobs. He worked on the railroad, he was the, worked in the post office, and uh, he was an, trained as an organist, or he trained himself as an organist, mm -hmm. even though he uh, was deaf, uh, partially deaf uh, since birth. Mm. And he played the organ at, and was the choir master at St. Stephen's Church here in Middlebury. Oh, really? But at some point, uh, his collection was such, and he was a, a, a tenant at One Park Street here in Middlebury, which is now the Sheldon Museum. And then he ended up buying the property. Hmm. And uh, the collection he'd amassed to, to date was in one room at the Sheldon. And, oh, um, wow. But he continued to collect. He did a lot of collecting through newspaper ads that he saw and writing letters. And the museum started in 1882, and under his leadership, it was here until 1907. And it's continued to operate uh, since then, and uh, this year, because it's its, anniversary, it's 200th anniversary of his wow. birth, we had a big celebration. Oh, that's great. And I think you have a picture of him. I sure do. So this is the picture we've chosen uh, for the bicentennial. And we found he had a hat similar to this without the 200 on it. <laughs> he was bearded, and so we dressed it up a little with the 200 on the hat and a little flower on his lapel. <laughs> and, um, and we've celebrated all year, and we'll continue probably to celebrate into next year. Oh, that's great. And I see you've continued the tradition of a flower in your lapel. That's right. <laughs> that's from, it's from bow ties right here in Middlebury. That's great. That's great. Wow. So you said he started with one room, had, was his collection, and it's certainly expanded since then Yes. Um, to, to the whole house. What are some of the uh, more popular or unusual uh, parts of the uh, permanent exhibit? Well, we, uh, th there are three buildings, or that's actually, there's three contiguous buildings and a separate uh, barn, a carriage barn that he built in 1888. So uh, the historic building, which houses the, the beginning of the museum, was built in 1829. Mm -hmm. He didn't buy it until 18, open it till 1882. So the building is three floors, and mm -hmm. back then there was a historic kitchen, there were several parlors, yeah. uh, there were bedrooms, and so in that building uh, we, have, we have historic rooms, we have a gift shop, Mm -hmm. as you enter, and then we have historic rooms that are filled with uh, furniture of the period. The furniture is, uh, by and large, by Middlebury furniture makers of his era. Oh, really? Oh. And there are also a lot of portraits of famous Middlebury um, pers uh, people, uh, such as a family that uh, were, were known for their uh, sheep farming and uh, and so there are a lot of lovely portraits that date probably from the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. We have a children's uh, room uh, for children activities. Uh, right now it's uh, closed because of COVID, but it costumes and games to play. Yeah. 
then we have a center section uh, that where we do our revolving exhibits. Mm -hmm. That was built in uh, in uh, 1992, and then a core part of the museum is our research center, which is the furthest building in the complex. It was built in 1972, and it has documents uh, and photographs celebrating the history of, uh, of Middlebury. And then there's also a garden and the historic barn that I mentioned that yeah. can be used as an education center. And right now it's used, though, however, as storage. <laughs> so there's a lot going on, which I can um, update you. Great. Yeah, I'd like to hear more. I, I remember um, going to the museum with one or both of my children when they were at Mary Hogan School, sure. a lot of school tours going through there. And one of the things I remember that uh, the the tour guide told, telling us about was the, um, wasn't there some teeth or something in one of the rooms? or a, Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the things that kids liked, you know, they right. sort of glom on. To well, Henry uh, collected a lot of, uh, his teeth are there. Yeah. And uh, they, I, they're shown right now during the special 200th anniversary exhibit. Uh-huh. Uh, and then children of your, your children's age remember the stuffed cat. Oh, yes. And which was used to be located on the bed, yeah. uh, but now it's in a case. And it, we don't bring it out all the time, but we brought it out for the, uh, for the uh, exhibit. Yeah. And so children over the years have, have enjoyed items such as the teeth and the cat, yeah. where we like more to promote the historical educational of values. <laughs> but for children, we also have had for... 30 some years, a model train exhibit every ah. Christmas. And we uh, welcome hundreds of people, and it's usually families, and it could be kids with their grandparents, with their parents, yeah. and they have a great time. Last year we didn't have it because of COVID. Right. And depending on what happens this year, we hope to reinstall it uh, for this Christmas, uh -huh. but it's all going to depend upon whatever restrictions sure. are imposed. Um, sure. Are imposed and then we time. also, every summer, have had a Pops concert. Yes. I and the fireworks at, in partnership with the college. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, families come and enjoy. It's usually around 4th of July weekend. Right. And so there's a lot of enjoyment uh, listening to yeah. music and seeing the fireworks and celebrating uh, our independence. Right. No, I, that's one of the things I, I love. It's a great community event uh, out there on the field at Middlebury College. And I think you couldn't have it last year. Right. You probably didn't do it. And did, did you do something this year, or was there a shortened version of something on no, the green this, this year? No, this year we, we didn't uh, do it in okay. 2019, and we uh, didn't do it in 2020. Okay. So, um, so the, the plan uh, is to continue with it, though. We hope to do it in 2021. I'm in a, uh, but the conversation is ongoing with the college. Uh, because they lend us their field and right. they help out uh, with all the installing it. Right. We actually uh, hire tent tenting and and the sound yeah. system, and then we engage the Vermont Philharmonic, has been the orchestra for the last several years. Yeah. So it's a it's an exciting event which we enjoy doing. Yeah. And uh, it it's one of our major fundraisers. Right. Oh, great. Of course. Of course. Well, let's go back to the train for a minute. Um, um, I remember that when my again when my kids were like, "Where is it? Where is it in the museum? Where do you set it up? And does it take a really long time?" I mean, those of us who bought train sets for our kids and on Christmas Eve were trying to put them together, and it doesn't always work so well. Right. So is this well, it's a uh, pretty difficult thing to put together. What's well, there's a team uh, that does it of volunteers. Uh, there's a couple mm -hmm. of leaders, and then the team is probably ten to fifteen, and it. Uh, if we were to start for this year, they're going to begin uh, the 1st of October. Putting it together. Putting it together. I mean, wow. it, it's, it's, a, it's a built platforms and there are multiple tracks. And uh, so it's all stored during the uh, winter and summer downstairs right. in our basement. Uh, but in each year, there are new uh, new offerings in the trains. Uh, ah. For instance, there's a milk dispenser, and there's all sorts of exciting wow. things for the kids. And uh, so it, 
begins in October, then we're not going to open it until probably uh, the week of uh, of the December first weekend okay. in December when there's this big open house throughout the town. Right, right. And uh, so it takes a long time, and but it's in the team that does it uh, with the help of Mary Manley, who's the associate director of the museum, has mm -hmm. been there over 20 years. Um, she's the main liaison and couldn't uh, happen without uh, yeah. without her. Wow. I didn't realize it took quite that long. That's, oh, that's right. really it's something. A, it's a big, big operation. It is. It and is. Uh, wow. Well, I'll appreciate it even more when I go see it right. again. Oh, so hopefully it'll be up this year. Yes. So we great. hope so. That's great. And then uh, in addition to the um, permanent exhibits, you have sort of temporary exhibits that are there for a few months or how right. how, how many of those do you do a year? We try to do at stay? least uh, three a year. Okay. Uh, this last, uh, this year, it's the 200th anniversary, so we have uh, one room devoted to Henry and then yeah. we have several auxiliary exhibit spaces. He collected canes, so in one exhibit space are his canes, another one's huh are relics that he collected, and another are oddities, such as the teeth yeah. <laughs> and, and, and the uh, cat. Uh, but this year, the center section of the museum and one room in the Judd Harris House mm -hmm. is devoted to special exhibits. Okay. Uh, so this year, and it continues through the, uh, through the October, uh, through the mid, uh, through September and uh, this year, uh, we had um, a retrospective of work mm. by uh, Trent Campbell, yeah. who for almost 20 years was the uh, photographer at the Addison Independent. Right. So he chose right. the 24 works. This happens to be one of a young mm -hmm. man uh, jumping uh, from a, over, uh, over a, a cliff, so to speak, into the water yeah. uh, on the on the creek that runs up to Lincoln. Right. And, That's um, a great picture. So joyous. And then we also, it's now uh, closed, but Kate Bond, who's an 80, now 83-year-old um, sculpt, metal sculptor from Burlington. Uh, we had her work, a retrospective of her work inside, and then uh, three of her outdoor sculpture continue. Uh -huh. And uh, in each case, we have gallery talks. Um, uh, we had gallery talks for Trent's exhibit, mm -hmm. we had gallery talks for Kate's exhibit, and we're about to open a uh, what's called Sight Lines. Uh, this is the uh, postcard uh, which features uh, paintings by Jill Madden and, uh, and um, photographs uh, by Caleb Kenna. Oh, great. And, uh, we're doing here what we, all, we often do. We have art and we have history. So we're celebrating uh, the wilderness areas uh, of the Green Mountains that were given by uh, Joseph Patel. Mm -hmm. Joseph Patel, a major figure in this community. Right. He actually paid for the, the current older bridge that's right here on Main Street. Oh, really? Okay. The, the Patel, Patel Block. Bridge, of course, the Patel Block. The Patel, Patel Block, he was responsible for. He was a wealthy man who was very uh, philanthropic. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, the painting, Jill actually goes out in the winter in the snow and mm -hmm. does landscape paintings of er various areas. Wow. Uh, Caleb is a, um, does drone photography wow. and he goes out in all seasons. Rightly, he's been featured in the New York Times in a special mm -hmm. article. And then we're going to have um, uh, gallery presentations. Uh, some of them in this year are going to be by Zoom because of COVID. Right. Uh, Bill McKibben, the famous environmentalist who teaches at Millbury College, mm -hmm. is uh, will be speaking uh, at one of the presentations. Great. As will Bill Amadon, who's another, he's a geography professor at the college, yeah. and then David Bain is going to talk about um, talk about Joseph Patel and his history. Yeah. So we combine history and art. It's all about community, and right. we want to celebrate our community and uh, the people uh, who have made it what it is. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That sounds like a wonderful program. Um, this uh, one I'll coming up is, is fabulous. We're just yeah. installing it 
uh, as we speak. Okay. And does it take a while to install? Does it, it do any Yes, it does, because especially if you have a lot of um, paintings or photographs, uh, the installation uh, takes time. Uh -huh. You have to label every painting or photograph. You have in introductory panels. Uh, you plan for the speakers. Uh, you have mm. to raise money and then thank the donors and then plan uh, for all, all the events. We have an opening reception. And uh, so it's, wow. but it's great fun. Yeah. It's one of the great rewards of the job for everyone at the museum. Sure. Yeah. Because wow. then you welcome the public and they, uh, can enjoy uh, the community and what yeah. we have to offer. Yeah, that's great. That's great. But I can see why you do about three a year, you said, because right. it's a lot of work to put them together, and then you want to give people right. time to. But it's three a year plus it. the pops, plus the. Uh, plus the train. <laughs> but the uh, museum is has a uh, staff, full time staff. We aren't full time, we're all part time of yeah. four. Okay. And then in right. addition to that, we have a bookkeeper and a housekeeper who are part-time. Uh, but we could not run uh, as non as all nonprofits could not without our trustees. Right. So we have uh, between 15 and 20 community members who are trustees mm -hmm. who um, lend their counsel and their uh, advice. And we couldn't yeah. run the museum without them, but of course without this very, my colleagues and this very capable staff sure. that I enjoy working with. That's great, so. that's great. And we have volunteers. Uh, when I came, oh. I had a party at my house and we invited over a hundred volunteers to wow. a reception. Not all a hundred came, but that just shows you, and it wow. changes from year to year, mm -hmm. uh, anywhere between probably 60 and 100 volunteers allow the Sheldon to yeah. operate. Well, that says a lot about the museum that you can get that many volunteers. Right. And there's some very Pretty dedicated, uh, dedicated yeah. people who have been volunteers uh, for years. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. That's great. Yeah. And do they, uh, you do a lot of school tours, don't you? Do you well, we, kids uh, we or not wait, as wait, many wait. as we once did because yeah. curriculums at some of the elementary schools and the middle schools have changed. Oh, okay. But we continue to um, talk to schools and uh, and. Welcome, uh, whether it's preschoolers, kindergartners, or yeah. from from uh, elementary through high school. Yeah, and we have a great relationship with the college, and uh, they bring down uh, to our research center, and they, uh -huh. which is devoted to the history of Middlebury. So we have photographs of Middlebury. We have a house book that Henry started. So if you Hmm. happened to own a historic home in Middlebury, it's likely oh. that he's okay. researched who owned it, who built yeah. it, and uh, so there are wow. a great number of research. But the college has been very helpful. A lot of the professors are trustees and the students mm -hmm. act as interns, and they're again a wonderful, valuable resource yeah. that allows us uh, to operate. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, I wanted to ask you about the research. Um, and you said it's, it's it's about Middlebury history specifically. Well, Middlebury, Addison County, and then it actually covers uh, some in national issues too. But the core of it yeah. is devoted okay. to, to Middlebury and Addison County. We have all the the newspaper copies of the Addison Independent, mm -hmm. and over the years there were other newspapers before the Addison Independent, and we ha have those available to look at yeah. right now because as the transition has occurred in the world to digital copies. Right. There are several uh, national organizations that now, uh, the Library of Congress, for instance, has some copies available online of the Addison Independent. Hmm. And there's something called okay. newspapers.com that also. Right. So students, because of technology, uh -huh. have gotten away in part from going through the right. actual the papers. original, right, right. But we still have them, and, and yeah. a lot of people, a lot of researchers and students just enjoy seeing the piece sure. of paper, and then you yeah. can see the ads that are on those pages, you can see the weather, you can see all that is reported. Right, you get a fuller picture of what was actually happening at right. that time, that's great. So is it mostly students and um, uh, college professors, or who comes no, to do research? No, well, uh, genealogists, a lot of oh. genealogists come, Interesting. and uh, historians. We uh, 
one books have been written based on our collection. Um, there was a same-sex wow. couple, uh, Charity and Sylvia from Waybridge, and there was a researcher who came and ended up writing a book about them. And uh, we have oh. a, um, a silhouette of them, which was bored by the National Portrait Gallery. And so, and there are other uh, collections that are of interest nationally, in that yeah. case, in, uh, in internationally. Oh, that's yeah. great. It's, it's amazing when you start digging in how much, how much a museum like this can do. It's, oh, yeah, we really have great. a lot. Yeah. And you mentioned at the uh, outset uh, that we just got a grant from the Vermont Arts Council. Mm. And yes. Uh, and uh, that was one of actually three grants we've gotten as we try to improve the windows and the heating system mm -hmm. of, of the museum. Yeah. Well, and that was going to, you, you read my mind. The next <laughs> thing I was going to ask you about was the, you got a cultural facilities grant from the Vermont Arts Council. Right. Um, That's for the he heating system. Okay. Which uh, uh, we have, it was three buildings. There were several separate, uh -huh. some of different aged he uh, mm -hmm. heating systems. So we've been gradually replacing them. Okay. But this was just awarded uh, uh, a little over uh, $20,000. That's great. Uh, we received grants uh, for that we're replacing or uh, uh, fixing the windows, restoring the windows, mm -hmm. and uh, there are a lot of windows. It's three stories. Right. And if you go right. by the Sheldon, you'll see uh, they've been painted and they're in the process of being restored. We got a grant from uh, from the Humanities Council. We got a grant from uh, Preservation Trust Vermont. Oh wow! And uh, we got a grant from. Uh, uh, Vermont, uh, from the Division for Historic Preservation. Oh, yes, sure. And uh, in partnership yeah, with something called the 1772 Foundation. And, um, hmm. and we've also had grants uh, in our research center to improve uh, the search features and, and uh, scanning of, of, uh -huh. of photographs. Wow. That's also from the, the, National, uh, the Human National Humanities. Oh, okay. So uh, it sounds like you've been pretty successful in your grant writing. Do you spend a lot of time writing grants or well, you or your staff? Well, I, I did m more of the grant writing uh, in the past. Recently, we've hired uh, uh, Taylor Rosini, who was an intern at the college, started mm -hmm. with us her freshman year. And then after graduation, she was hired in one capacity and recently evolved into a grant writer. Oh, wonderful. So. Um, so I've written some. She's sort of she's in charge now, and uh -huh. she's held help uh, from some of the trustees and my uh, other colleagues. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so does she sort of scour the internet or whatever to find out what grants are available? Right. I mean, you probably know some that you can apply to right. multiple well, times. Vermont, and right, the, right here we have the Vermont Community Foundation. Yep. And they offer grant programs, and in there, one of their the benefits of. Uh, Going there is there's something called the Foundation Center, which is uh, has uh, access to all grants, and you can just search through what grants have been given to Vermont, yep. and then you can search in what areas, whether it be historic preservation or whether it be hmm. exhibits. Um, so there's a lot of resources. It's just a question yeah. of identifying the right grant opportunity, right. making the application, and then waiting to hear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't always get the grant. We've right. been uh, fairly successful, but we, a few grants have been turned down this year, yeah. too. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's a lot of work to keep a nonprofit organization running, right. and, um, and it, we're lucky, or it's nice that there are so many um, organizations that offer grants for you. Right. Uh, but which is great, and I know you have to do fundraising. Right, and as we well, can't right? operate without the support of the community. Right, we have a membership program, and then we also have an annual fund, which right now I uh, just sent out the annual fund solicitation early. We usually do it in December uh -huh. because of tax reasons, but we sent it out early because a group of our uh, trustees has done a match. So anybody oh. that gives money. This group of trustees are going to match it. Yeah. Also, if if you take out a membership, uh, they'll match that money. Yeah. So we have this incentive 
uh, this year, um, through the end of the year at least. Yeah. Because uh, we have a budget of about a quarter of a million, 250,000. And since we were all closed all last year, right. there was no money coming in uh, for admissions. We have a that's right. Very That's a big, very yeah. small admissions charge. It's only five dollars for an adult, uh -huh. uh, four fifty for retired people, and then lesser for for uh, kids between kids. twelve and uh, sixteen or yeah. something. Yeah. So fundraising, uh, other than grants, is a big part of uh, sure. my job. Sure. So. Yeah. But wow. get to meet everybody, so that's great. I bet. And how long have you been there now, Bill? I came in uh, June of 2012. Okay. And um, so it'll be 10 years uh, this June. This June. And and there's news about what's that's happening That's right. This I've June. decided after 10 years that uh, we need new, new blood, <laughs> and I need to try other things. So um, I'll be retiring after, in June of 2022 June. after 10 years. And we announced it. I announced it early, and the board is now in the midst of, uh, of advertising uh -huh. uh, for a new executive yeah. director, and uh, we've already begun, uh, they've begun the search committee to receive uh, resumes, and I think oh. they've probably already received over 50. Really? Well, That's Vermont, and well, the Sheldon is known, and Vermont is a very, uh, a place that people want to come to. Right. Especially after our success in controlling, uh, controlling um, COVID. Yeah. Plus the beauty of the state, the beautiful beauty of this community, and all this community has to offer, and the history of the Sheldon. I'm just astonished that you they already have around 50. I mean, so many of our businesses and other organizations put out, you know, they can't hire people. So right. um, I'm delighted that you're not having that same. <laughs> Problem, no. but I'm just amazed. That's wonderful. Well, it sort of replicated. Uh, Rokeby uh, had a search a year ago, uh -huh. and uh, everything picked up after Ro after uh, the Vermont's premier place uh, under COVID. So yeah, yeah, uh, we've we become much more popular. Right. Yeah. Oh, but we have other reasons to be sure. popular other than. And and uh, is the is the nature of the executive director job going to change with uh, a new person coming in? Did the trustees uh, talk they, about what they want to do? Well, what they see going forward. Or? Well, we're, we've just done a new strategic plan, which will uh, be the map by which the new executive director uh, operates. But uh -huh. the position description is not dissimilar, uh, uh -huh. dissimilar to uh -huh. mine. Okay. So. Okay. But do you see the future of museums changing and how they're used? Or well, um, it's, uh, there has been a change already because mm -hmm. of electronic media, mm -hmm. and uh, whereas we used to get more college students down to do research with right. primary documents, meaning you look at the document. Right. Uh, a lot of those documents are now available on the internet, uh, but we continued in this particular case with Middlebury College. Uh, we have a good relationship with members of the departments, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they often do J terms or spring terms, uh, tailored around uh, the primary documents yeah. and objects we have at the museum, which allows us to continue to have uh, have these students on site right. to look at the documents and the objects. Yeah, yeah. So the the nature of research may be changing, but the the building. And Henry Sheldon's collection probably right. isn't going to change. And then you have your revolving exhibits, yes. so that you'll continue to do that. Oh, and there's always new artists and new ways to do things that are right. fascinating. So, and because we're blessed in Middlebury and in Vermont with wonderful, um, wonderful artists, yeah, and many of them are right here in Addison County and Middlebury, and um, we've had. My first exhibit was a fashion exhibit. It oh. was based upon uh, the clothing we have in, yeah. the, in the collection. And the artist happened to be, in that case, from Shelburne. And she did her own, uh, she made her own costumes. Wow. And we matched the two. That's great. And uh, we've had photography exhibits. And uh, we've had so many exhibits. So th three yeah. exhibits a year over 10 years is yeah. quite a few. That is quite a few. Right. That's great. Well. 
Um, I, I think the place has flourished under your leadership and I'm excited for you and your retirement and well. whatever comes next. Um, we're just about to wrap things up here. Um, so uh, maybe you could tell us the hours of the Sheldon Museum. Sure, for right now know. we're open uh, Tuesday through Friday, mm -hmm. uh, 11 to four. Okay. We had to cut back a little this year. Yep. Um, Saturday, uh, 10 to four. Okay. So that's um, five days a week. Yep. And um, uh, the research center, you, you can make an appointment uh, th on Thursday or Friday afternoon. You Great. have to call ahead. Okay. The number is 388-2117. Great. Thank you so much for coming on the show, Bill. I really appreciate your time and knowing more about the Sheldon Museum. That's it for now. My guest today has been Bill Brooks, the executive director of the Henry Sheldon Museum. Thanks to MCTV for producing this show. Thank you for watching, and we hope to see you next time.